As I just said, today we commemorate St. Francis of Assisi. When Francis heard these words from Matthew's Gospel read at Mass, he took them as a message directly from God for how he should live. Leaving the church that day, he took off his shoes and left his staff and his cloak and replaced his belt with a length of rope. And that, along with the undyed smock that he was wearing underneath, became the, his, the uniform for the rest of his life, as well as for all the Franciscans that came after him. But I wonder if the bit about the clothing is actually the least important part of that story. Francis' feast day is associated with the season of creation because of his well-known attitude towards animals. He was very fond of his fellow creatures, even to the point of considering them his siblings. I've heard it said that he even used to move earthworms out of the road so they wouldn't get trampled underfoot. As I read again this gospel today, it occurs to me that perhaps what Francis might have taken from this story is less about what he should be wearing and more about how he could share himself with others. Francis' life as a friar, beyond just his interesting relationship with animals, is marked by poverty. Not only did he renounce his own wealth and resolve to live only on what he could beg from others, he insisted upon this for the community that grew up around him as well. As the number of his followers grew, he continued to insist that they not hold any property or wealth in common like other religious orders did. He would not allow them to live in fancy convents or monasteries because that wasn't true poverty. Now, for Francis, poverty was less about not having anything than it was about freely giving what one had, just like Jesus says in his speech today. And that is, by the way, what sets the kind of poverty that Francis practiced apart from the kind of poverty that we see on the streets in our own cities and towns. That kind of poverty, which is caused by social inequality, is not a virtue, but a system of a broken, or a symptom of a broken system. But by contrast, Francis' poverty is more of a mindfulness about how much we already depend on God for everything and a conscious decision to place one's trust on that dependence. Jesus says, you received without payment, give without payment. Francis' experience of God's unmerited grace convinced him to intentionally live by giving without payment, just as Jesus said. For him, this meant everything, not just clothing or money or property, but also love. And I think this might be why he showed so much affection for animals. While most people considered animals to be beneath people and therefore unworthy of the same care or respect one would give a human, Francis intentionally extended to them the same love and care that he would for any person, love that he himself had first received without price. Maybe the best example of this is the story of the wolf of Gubbio. The story goes that Francis was living in the town of Gubbio when a fierce wolf began attacking livestock. Eventually, it graduated to attacking people as well, and soon it began feeding on people exclusively. He was known for hanging around the city gates and attacking anyone who ventured out. According to the story, no weapon was capable of harming him, and anyone who attempted to destroy him was devoured. It got to the point that the townspeople were afraid to leave their homes at all. And so that's when Francis decided to take action. He went with a dozen townsfolk or, folk or so to seek out the wolf's lair. When they arrived, everybody hung back while Francis approached the lair and the wolf charged him with teeth bared. But instead of running away or attacking, wolf, or, uh, Francis made the sign of the cross and commanded the wolf in the name of God to stop. At once, the wolf trotted docilely up to Francis and laid its head in his hands. Francis spoke to the wolf, calling him brother and promising that in spite of his terrible crimes, if he promised to cease his attacks, he would be forgiven and the people of the town would provide for him for all of his needs. And so the wolf signaled his agreement to this oath by placing his paw 
on Francis' own hand. Francis then led the wolf back to the town where the people were astonished to see this fierce, murderous beast in the company of the humble Francis. He brought the wolf to the town square and the two renewed their pact publicly in front of everybody. And from that day on, Francis was not only venerate, not only did the town venerate Francis, but the wolf kept his word. He would trot around town going from door to door where people would feed him. He became sort of a mascot in the town. And a couple years later when he died, the town was so sad that they gave him a burial like they would any other honored citizen of the city. While the story itself is probably more legend than fact, it illustrates beautifully what poverty meant to Francis. The wolf in the story certainly deserved to die, right? Because it was both dangerous and evil. The townsfolk would have preferred to kill him if they could have. And something tells me that if the story happened today, we wouldn't be that much different. After all, it's just a wolf. But Francis didn't see it this way. The wolf wasn't just anything. It was a fellow creation of the same God who created him. So instead, he gives his peace, his love, his respect freely to all, including this wolf who is not worthy of it. He's unconcerned about whether the wolf deserves mercy, but offers it because it was freely given to him first. That's all that matters. Unlike many of us, he does not stop to draw the line between human and non-human, the line where love no longer extends. Or perhaps he acts intentionally to undraw that line. For Francis, the wolf, along with the sun, the moon, the wind, fire, even death itself, Entities that we would consider subordinate to humanity or inconsequential or even evil. These things are his siblings, fellow creatures of dust and mud and servants of the same God. The second chapter of Genesis describes God creating animals and birds by saying that God formed them out of the ground. And we remember that that is from what God formed the first man. In a sense, all the animals are full siblings with Adam, having, as Francis might say, the same father God and the same mother earth. In spite of the fact that Adam does not find among them a suitable partner, they remain one family. In Francis' story, violence cannot solve the problem of the wolf. All the weapons are useless and all the warriors failed. Only Francis armed, so to speak, with nothing but the love of Christ, was able to bring about a solution, and one that was mutually beneficial to everyone, including the wolf. Only in love do all of God's creatures thrive. That's what Francis understood. Perhaps something he learned from his intentional life of poverty, that it is only God's love that allows anything to thrive. Because it is God's love in which and by which everything was created. And so, listening to this story today, I wonder what we can learn from Francis. Here's a man who had everything that life had to offer. Anything anybody could want. Wealth, connections, poverty, or luxury, comfort, security. And yet, it wasn't in what he had, but in what he didn't have that God was revealed to him. Everything that he had, he realized, was a gift. Something that he received without payment. A gift that was intended to be shared. It might seem ridiculous to us to extend compassion to a mouse or a tree or a stone, but Francis asks, what does it cost us to do that? When we have received so much from God already, all without asking, Does it really hurt us to share? And that's a deep question. Especially when showing compassion like that means changing our patterns of consumption or altering the lifestyles that make us so comfortable. Sometimes that question asks us to give up much. 
But Francis is there to ask, are we giving up any more than we have already received? As we read Matthew's story today, it's easy to point to the actions in verses 7 and 8 as declarations of the gospel, right? Proclaiming the good news, curing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, casting out demons. But what about the actions in the rest of the story? Can letting go and giving up and depending entirely on the generosity of others also be a declaration of the gospel? Can radical poverty like that actually reveal God to us or to others? When Francis did that, lived in intentional poverty, people started joining him. I can find no record that he ever actually invited anyone to do that. They just did. They saw him in his poverty, and something about that spoke to them, and they joined him. And this wasn't just poor people, people who already had nothing. These were, the first folks were, were rich, just like Francis had been. Like Francis, they renounced everything they had because they saw, because uh, something about what they saw in Francis and his lifestyle was captivating to them. Within 10 years, over 5,000 people had begun emulating Francis' lifestyle, letting go of everything to follow Jesus. For all of the divisions and the disagreements in the church over the years, it's often been said of Francis that he's the one saint that everybody agrees should be canonized. And so I wonder, what is it about this simple, uneducated man living as a beggar, completely dependent on the generosity of others, that speaks to us of God, that makes him a saint in our minds? How does he show us Jesus? What hope does he give us for ourselves? I wonder if, in humbly seeing himself as a part of God's whole creation rather than a lord over it, he realized how poor he really was. And if maybe that poverty helped him to understand the riches that God gave him.